Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And I've got a really special guest today, like an incredibly talented guy, like off, off the charts, talented and a really nice guy and just a great musician, a great writer as well. With Rob Ikes, let me tell you a little bit about Rob. Um, he is a 15 time, 15 time, International Bluegrass Music Association Dobro Player of the Year Award. I mean, even Michael Jordan only won the World Series six times. I mean, the championship series, uh, which means that Rob is actually the most awarded instrumentalist in the history of the IBMA Awards. Do you have like a, a massive... A uh, trunk to keep up. I up. do. They're over they're right in there. And uh, my wife was saying, "Oh, you should put those behind you for your interview." I was like, "Nah, I'm not gonna do that." No, no. Like normal musicians don't do that ever, ever. Yeah. <laughs> I did see a good friend of mine did a Zoom interview recently, our Instagram thing, and he had his Grammys right behind. <laughs> yeah. Uh, crack me up. Crack me up. Whatever. Like, dude, we know you're great. You don't have to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But most most guys are like, you know, they have their studio, like they have the guitars that are being behind them and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, Rob's released five solo records, 12 albums with the band Blue Highway, which is a contemporary bluegrass band that he founded and was a member of for 21 years. He also has four instructional Dobro DVDs, and he also has a new site called BigMusicTent.com that he just launched that uh, working with instructional Dobro stuff, which we'll talk about later. He's the founder and producer of an event called Rezo Summit, which is a three-day educational event held in Nashville annually since 2007. Is uh, This year, got, I'm, I'm assuming it had to get canceled. We haven't made a decision yet. Right on. Hold, yeah. So hold we'll out. See. We might even Zoom it, turn it into a Zoom. Yeah. You know, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, and he also serves as an instructor, instructor at music workshops and camps here in the States and in Europe. And he's also a two-time Grammy Award winner. He's played or collaborated with Vince Gill, Earl Scruggs, Merle Haggard, Alan Jackson, Reba McIntyre, Alison Krauss, Tony Rice, David Grisman. This is like, but this one was really weird. Willie Nelson. And then was this accurate? David Lee Roth? Oh, there's a good story there, yeah. Oh, great. We'll talk. I'm like, you know, like, remember that old thing on Sesame Street? One of these things is not like the others. It was like David Lee Raw. Uh, yeah. Dolly Parton, Mary Chapin Carpenter, Johnny Cash, Steve Warner, who we had here on the show, Peter Frampton, and others. He's also released three albums with guitarist Trey Hensley, and these guys have become really quite a well-known duo, and for good reason. I mean, it's... Like I was, I was talking to Rob before we started recording. I was like, man, you listen to YouTube play and you just like, you want to, you feel like you should put down your guitar and never pick it up again. These guys are just hot as anything. And uh, Rob and Trey have played or collaborated with together, Tommy Emmanuel, Taj Mahal, David Grisman, Yorma Kalkinen and Hot Tuna. Love those guys. Uh, Luther Dickinson, Molly Tuttle and loads of others. In the last six years, as I said, they've released three albums, and they're called Before the Sun Goes Down, The Country Blues, and last year's World Full of Blues, and I know we'll talk about those today. Rob, thank you so much for your time, and I appreciate you coming on the show. Hey, great to be here, man. My pleasure. Uh, I want to get into your story first, but uh, congratulations. First of all, I know it's nice to get all the accolades and all the awards, and you know, we joked about the big trunk to hold them in, but uh, you've done a lot of really you've played with some meaningful people, man, like heavy, you know, soulful cats. And I'm sure that is, you know, validates you more than any award can do. Yeah. I mean, I was telling a friend of mine the other day, just, we were just talking about life and everything. And I was like, uh, man, I played with Merle Haggard, Earl Scruggs and Tony Rice. And, you know, wow. I mean, I, for, I need to just tell myself that when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> yeah. It's tough to do. <laughs> yeah. No, it is because I, you're like busy getting this stuff done. Yes. I mean, you read that list off and honestly, I forget or I just, I don't know. You're so focused on your uh, bubble, you know, the present bubble that right. uh, you forget about that stuff. And I'm thinking about, ah, you know, I want to play this song or I want to learn this piece or, you know, working on this. So I guess I'm always kind of in the laboratory and I don't pull my head out much to look back, you know. Yeah, I think that's a tom a common trait of like type A <laughs> driven people in general. You're you know, it's hard to you know, stop and you know, it's not your nature to pat yourself on the back. It's just like progress is what you measure yourself by. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's pretty uh 
it's uh but it is great i mean when i think about i mean it just because those are all people that i grew up listening to yeah i mean i i uh i have this i remember sitting at the light when i was probably 12 my mom was driving me home from school and this merle haggard song came on called Kern River, you know, and it just took me to a different planet, you know, and I don't even think I'd been playing music yet, but, you know, to work with somebody like that, uh, wow, you know, and same with Earl Scruggs, and of course, Tony Rice is such a huge influence, you know, um, but yeah, so I just got a, uh, you know, it's it's been an amazing run so far, and I hope it just keeps going. <laughs> oh, awesome, why not, man, yeah. Uh, okay, so you grew up in San Francisco. Was there an active bluegrass scene there? Yeah, man, there's, there's an active bluegrass I didn't know that. everywhere, I think. It's just a little, usually below the radar, you know. Um, but believe it or not, so when I started playing, uh, my grandparents owned a campground up on the Eel River, which is in Humboldt County. Okay. In the Redwoods, middle of nowhere. And so and my, that side of my family played a lot of music. My grandparents were very involved in the old time fiddle scene. And my grandpa's, he was from North Dakota and everybody in his family played fiddle and guitar and just everything. And so they had music at their house every Thursday night. And in the summers, they ran this campground that they started, they built, you know, in 62 up in the Redwoods. Um, and so I used to spend my summers up there and help them out. And uh, so I think I was 12 and uh, I just started playing. And my grandma just went into the little town. I mean, tiny, probably like, you know, 600 people in this town. That is tough. And, wow. uh, does anybody teach Dobro? You know, and sure enough, there's this guy and he's a great player. His name's Ron Stanley. And uh, he came out to the campground once a week all summer and just, he wrote out tablature for me. And uh, I didn't have a dobro, but I used my mom's old K guitar. And okay. I raised the action and played a guitar, you know, dobro style. Sure. And he would bring his dobro and he would bring another dobro for me to play. And it had the resonator, you know, so just to, to actually play a real dobro just blew my mind. And, uh, but I always thought that was funny, you know, that this, this great player lived out there in the sticks and he was a great teacher too. So he really got me on a good start. So, so he gave me lessons that summer. What was it about Dobro? You obviously fell in love with the instrument and you're still in love with it because you couldn't be as successful as you, as, you know, you couldn't just like at this level be doing this for Thank a paycheck. You. Yeah. You know, what about the instrument do you love so much? Well, I got to show you. I'll grab yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's dig it. This is the record that blew my mind my when I was uh, 12 years old. And, uh, you know, I was kind of getting the bug to play. My older brother played banjo. My mom played guitar. And so they went to some bluegrass festivals. And I went to my first festival around that same time. I was about 12 or 13. <clears throat> and on the way back from the festival, uh, my brother put in a tape of this record and just I went, what is that instrument? You know, I just loved the sound I was hearing. And so it was really like an explosion, you know, like a bolt of lightning. And um, the sound of the instrument made me feel so good. It was like a drug. And for weeks after uh -huh. that, when I went to bed, I mean, I listened to this record all day long and then I had a cassette of it. And I'd, at night I I'd hit play and fall asleep to it. And then when I woke up in the morning, I hit play. It went deep inside, man. I can't explain how or why, but it did. And uh, just been kind of living off that ever since, man. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. So it must have been a hell of a treat to play with Mike. Yeah, yeah. Great player. And um, I met him when I was a kid. I've got some pictures of me when I'm like 14, you know, bugging him at a workshop somewhere. And uh, he was, it was always super nice to me. And um, if we were ever playing at the same festival, we would try and get off, you know, somewhere and just play some Dobros together. And that was always a thrill and an honor. He was a very classy guy. He always dressed really good and looked good and had a nice car. You know, he was, uh, he was just Mr. Cool of the Dobro. Um, and, uh, and it was a thrill just a few years ago, um, we did an album, he and I and Jerry Douglas called Three Bells and it's just three Dobros and that's all that's on the record. And that was nominated for a Grammy, I think in 2014 or 15. 
And uh, what a thrill to work with both those guys. They're yeah. both my main heroes, you know. So uh, we had a ball. Mike, Mike had a blast. But that's what I mean, you know, like earlier, when I think about that I got to do a record with my hero, you know, that just blows my mind. So Yeah, it's amazing. It's freaky. It is freaky. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's the dobro is such a, it's a smaller world. I mean, it's not an instrument that everybody oh, knows. Very much. So, um so I don't know, maybe, maybe it's hard for people to relate, but I think everybody has, you know, these dreams and, you know, we all have things, but it's, it is bizarre when they come true and it's just, been, that's, a, it's just been, it's all good, man. That's fantastic. Do you look at, um, how do you view your entry into what you're doing as far as like, uh, right place, right time, divine intervention, serendipity, a little of everything, you know, because it's, you know, you know, like sometimes you look back or you see a movie and you say, man, if, if I had made a left turn today, my whole life would be different. And I, this didn't happen to me. Yeah, man. I've heard great stories. You know, I, I, I don't know if you know Carl Jackson, but he's a very no. famous instrumentalist, songwriter, guitar player, banjo player. Uh, and he, he was with Glenn Campbell forever and, uh, he met him. He was, uh, he and Keith Whitley had just started a band. This was like around 80, 80, maybe 81. And, uh, they, and they were having a rehearsal and Keith said, Hey, Glenn Campbell's playing at the state fair. This is way out in Eastern Kentucky out in the sticks. Let's go, uh, let's go check it out. So, okay. Yeah. So they're walking through the festival grounds, you know, the carnival, the fair, and, uh, and they run into Larry McNeely, who was playing banjo and guitar with Glenn Campbell at that time. And long story short, uh, Larry says, well, actually, I have this. Carl says, well, maybe, you know, so Carl, he says, go get your guitar and your banjo and come to the trailer backstage. So Carl does, and Glenn loves it, and he hires him, and he moves to L.A. and spends the next 15, 20 years <laughs> oh, crazy. with, with Glenn Campbell, you know, wow. so you, you broke, I love, what's that? He broke up just for a second when you said what, what, uh, the, what the guy was telling Carl. Yeah. So, uh, so Larry McNeely tells Carl, Hey, get your banjo, your guitar and come audition backstage, you know? So he goes back and meets Glenn Campbell. That's crazy. Glenn, Glenn loves it and hires him and, and Carl moves to Los Angeles and he's with Glenn for, you know, 20 years or whatever. So that became his career. Uh, so I know what you're saying. And I mean, for me, um, it was definitely moving to Nashville, you know? Um, I had played with some great groups in California and I did about as much as you could do out there, but there's just not a ton going on, you know, in the music biz for this kind of music. Yeah. Know? Just as a, the instrument I play and the music yeah. that I, that I, uh, that I do. Um, and so, uh, so I went to college and I played in some great groups, but you know, it's just nothing real steady. And I had always wanted to move to Nashville and I had a good friend who had moved out here and he ended up playing with Allison Krauss. He's still with her. His name's Ron Block, great musician. Oh yeah, I know Ron, yeah. And I had some other friends who were out here. And, um, and so I came out and then actually Allison had hired me to play on a few records that she was producing. This is back around 1990. Um, and I had so much fun working with her and the band and the studio was amazing. That definitely, tipped it over for me and said, I'm moving to Nashville, you know? Okay. And so I moved out here, I guess about a year after that. So I got here in the fall of 92 and, but you know, I mean, I, and I started off, you know, working with some great people, but it, it, it's not even, and I've heard this story a lot, you know, just even uh, no matter how great you are, it takes a little while for the phone to start ringing, you know? Yeah. But, um, but but I did get in a really great band right off the bat, a band called Blue Highway, and I was with them for 21 years. You know, right. so that was a great a great break for me, just hooking up with those guys. Um, and so Tim Stafford, the guitar player, had played with Allison Krauss for a few years, and that's where we met. And okay. so when I moved to Nashville, he called me pretty early on, and first he hired me to play on a record he was producing, and then he asked if I wanted to join this band he was putting together, and I said, heck yeah, man. And uh, so then that turned out to be a 21-year gig, and it's a, it was a great gig. They're great guys, and it was great music. 
So anyway, so yeah, but when I moved here, you kind of sit out on the coast or wherever you're from and you go, you know, I think I'm good, but you know, who knows? And then when you come here and you work with people who are as into it as you are, all this synergy and great stuff happens, you know? So when I heard myself with these great musicians in a great studio, I just went, bells and whistles went off. It's like, that's what I need. That's, that's what I'm missing. You know, I feel like I've done well out here in California and things have gone well, but that is what I'm looking for in my head. Right. <laughs> that sound, those tones, that rhythm section, that quality level. Yeah, that right, that of course. Not getting out here, you know. Um, and so I moved out here and, and just been super busy ever since, you know. Um, what are, you mentioned your, the quality level. What are some of the like intangible things? And I know I'm, I'm not trying to put you on the spot because I know you don't like to sit. This is not about you beating on your chest, but there's a lot of, especially where you are, there's a lot of talented people. What do you feel are some of the intangible things that's allowed you to succeed and to sort of um, continue to move in those circles where you can somehow manage to increase the level of musicianship and your own technical expertise along the way? Oh, hey, what do you mean by intangible? Do you mean? Well, as opposed to, hey, man, I practiced a thousand hours a month. Right. You know, everybody's well, done that. I mean, I hate to say some square things here, but, uh, you know, when I... When I started getting sessions, um, I, other musicians started recommend, recommending me. Mm -hmm. And when I worked with these guys on sessions, I made some observations. You know, these guys get here early. They're tuned up. They're ready to go. They don't fart around. Uh, there's a lot of money being spent on a recording session most of the time. And yeah. And so I kind of took note of these, they might be more like business things or uh, yeah. they're non-musical things uh, to a certain extent. Yeah. But I, so I immediately picked up on that because I was just a kid, you know, I was probably in my early twenties. And, uh, and so I just, I started doing that, you know, and, and not that I was flaky before that, but, um, but I don't know. Was, that was something I learned for sure. And I tell other people that when they move to Nashville, it's like, man, show up early, do what, do what you're, do what you say you're going to do. Just do the best you can and uh, move on and get out of there. And they'll call you. If you do a good job, they'll call you back. You know, the cream always rises to the top. And I think yeah. that's true in this town for the most part, um, as far as musicians anyway. Um, it's but, a supportive uh, community too, for the people that are like, on it like that are on time that are you know the early in there accommodated know their parts yeah and i think for me i guess yeah when you when you grow up playing bluegrass i don't know any musician like this probably like jazz guys you just you're so critical you know you, and it's easy i work with guys you get in on a session and everybody's just like ah oh, this you know this microphone sucks or you know that you know i'm not i can't hear this i can't hear the drums i can't you know and there's a way to uh, to communicate that, but in a more positive way. Okay, how and, did you? That's it. And that's something I learned too, you know, because it's just real easy for me to go dark or complain or or you just get so picky. I think that's what it is. Yeah. And I would play on these sessions, and I would just go, "Man, this doesn't sound like Tony Rice's album. I've failed." <laughs> and uh, and and so you just gotta just bring what you can do it and, and do the best you can. And sometimes all the pieces aren't there, but you can bring, make your part of the thing as good as it can be. And so that was something I think I had to learn, you know, just not be so critical all the time. It's still something I battle, but, um, but I try to think about, and again, it's just from hanging out with guys who do it a lot and, and have a great attitude, you know, um, what can I bring to this and make it okay? Maybe this is my this isn't the kind of song that I would go out and buy. Right. But what can I bring to it, and how can I make this as good as it can be? And that's a, that's a way better attitude to have. How did you, as a young man, get hip to that? Um, they have the awareness to, uh, I guess, tell the difference between someone who's saying, "Hey, this microphone sucks," and someone who's saying, "Man, I don't feel like I'm getting." the sound that I need to be, cause that's a very subtle, but huge 
you know, communication skills well, like that as a young in enough different worlds. I mean, you know, when you live here, you play on some great sessions, you play on some crappy sessions, you play on some in between, you know, it's just kind of all over the map. And I think I just realized that what I play on the really good are the, you know, the master said the main yeah. individual sessions. It was a different environment then. And I, you know, I'm not even saying it was, it's always better or anything, but, um, but I just noticed this sort of speed and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, a more, a little more business-like. And yeah. again, I'm, you know, maybe that's not, maybe that's the best, not, not the best thing all the time. Again, they're all different. You can't even, right. I mean, there's sometimes when it's like, uh, don't work so fast. You know, sometimes you'll be in there. Okay. Okay. How is that? Well, take your time. Take, I tell you what, work on this for like 10 minutes. I'm going to go, the other producer was, like, I'm going to go get a coffee. Just play <laughs> with this song for like 10 minutes, you know, and I'll come back and take as many passes as you want. So it's funny, they're all different. Yeah. You just have to go in with an open mind. And, uh, but I, maybe that's the key is that I've learned to assess the difference. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of so session I, guy. Yeah, so when I get in there, I'm like, okay, this is a certain kind of session, I'm chill. And it's gonna be loose, but it'll be fun. And this is what it's gonna be. And, um, and then sometimes they're not like that. And it's all about speed and not and quantity more than quality. And so yeah. you just can't kind of assess the situation and you always try and do your best, but yeah, they are kind of all different. And I guess you just got to be sensitive to that. And there's a non-musical thing. <laughs> well, yeah, it's awesome. Uh, guys have said this before. Like some of the things I've heard uh, explained to me is things you got to assess are who's, who's, the head who's the big dog right who's the like cranky one that's gonna like start trouble yes. uh who's you know who's the you know where's the producer stand in all this is he very or she very involved or it's yeah. a very very it's, it's a, sometimes yeah. you get on these big sessions and you think okay and you're working with this producer oh man it's gonna be awesome this guy's gonna just you know tell everybody exactly what he wants you know and he doesn't say a thing all day <laughs> he, she doesn't say a thing all day you know wow. and it's just and it really that's most of the time it's like that the musicians do it you know the musicians communicate with each other and uh, throw ideas out and the producers love that honestly i mean they love not not say they don't have ideas, but they want to, they want a bunch of ideas. They want to know, especially if they trust you, you know, how does it feel to you? Do you, does, do you feel a dobro solo there or you want to play lap steel or, you know, uh, and again, they're all different. You know, every group is going to be different. Every group of musicians that you're with that day. So it's a trippy world, man. It's uh, and I think for maybe for my instrument too, because um, it's not like bass where every song has this guy on bass, you know, and he does his thing and, right. and, uh, you know, not every record has Dobro on it. So, um, so I think I get maybe more variety of sessions. I don't know. I don't know, but it's, it's always interesting, man. <laughs> Very cool. Hey, when you played with, uh, Reba, it was Jeff King in the studio with you all? I know Jeff. I don't think he was there that day, but that was a, that was a fun session. That was an overdub. And, um, and yeah, uh, so I knew the producer, Buddy Can, and I'd worked with him some. And so it was at her studio. She's got a killer studio called Starstruck, right on Music Row, 16th Avenue, I think. Um, so I went in there, and it's, you know, just everything top of the line, just great studio, great engineer. And they were overdubbing myself and the fiddle player, um, Larry, I can't remember his last name, but he plays with the Time Jumpers. Great session guy, kind of a Western Swing guy from Texas. Right. Uh, so they, so I think we listened to the track. It's called, uh, I'm going to take that mountain, uh, uh, Jerry Sally song. Um, it was a, like her fastest number one she ever had came out. Wow. Of, I don't know, around 2000, maybe. Um, Very cool. But it's a great song. It has kind of a bluegrass energy, you know? And so they were adding Dobro and fiddle to accent that, I think. And so, uh, so we listened to it and we went out there and we did one take and they just freaking loved it. And it was one of those things where like, awesome. you know, the producer was there and Reba and like eight other people, you know, the entourage in, in the control room. So it was a little intimidating, you know, yeah. um, and just, you know, after you'd play a take, it'd be a lot of this or, you know, uh, just kind of funny to see that many people, uh, 
in on something. Uh, but anyway, um, but we took a few more takes um, and uh, I know they ended up keeping the, the first take for me. I'm not sure about the fiddle, but, um, and then I split it and it was on the radio a couple months later, you know. It's, That's so uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. So that was fun. You know, I just felt like, and I was pretty, you know, again, it was first take, so I felt like there was a lot of energy. I was pretty excited, you know, excited slash nervous. Uh. <laughs> well, with all those people in the control room. And is it, is it the situation? I, I'm sure, even though there's eight or ten people, there's one or two people making, the, and then all the others, five or six, are just agreeing with it. It has to be, because you can't yeah, have that many there's chiefs. An order, there's an order of nodding. <laughs> right, right. That's what I'm saying. It's, you can't have everybody, like, valid on an opinion there, man. That's so yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah, But, um, so, yeah, it, it was great. So, just that one song, and um, and that was really fun. Uh, and then I did some TV stuff with her when the record came out, so. That's great, man. Yeah, yeah, so she's, yeah, she's a great artist, you know, I've always been a fan of hers, and yeah, she can really do it, she can really do it, so it was fun, and I did something else with her and Justin Timberlake a couple years after that, they did a, they did a single together, and that was fun also, um, but yeah, yeah, so you never know, you know. Yeah, very cool. Hey, I'm going to uh, mention some folks you've worked with. Tell me how the gig came out, how you got the gig, or how'd you meet them, and any kind of cool or interesting story about working with them. Uh, let's start with Vince Gill. Uh, yeah, I met him. I think he had a big party a long time ago, um, and he invited a lot of folks from country music and bluegrass to his house, and he was starting a thing called All for the Hall, where he was um, trying to get artists to donate one night of income to the Hall of Fame. He does a lot for the Hall oh, of Fame. Oh, wow. And so that yeah, was great. And he's always just been a super, he's just a super chill guy, you know. Um, I love his demeanor and he's very knowledgeable about a lot of different music, but I think his heart is in bluegrass, you know, cause he grew up playing it, I mean, I've got records of him playing guitar when he was probably 17, you know, and um, so he, 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 he loves that, um, you know, and then I, when I played with Earl Scruggs, I met Vince, you know, several times and he would play with us at the Opry sometimes or whatever, or, or Earl Scruggs had a big birthday party every January. Okay. And uh, he and Amy were always there and there'd be, you know, we'd be sitting around jamming and uh, in the living room and that was always sort of a big just a, a great night for the whole, just for everybody. It was super, super cool. I mean, Earl Scruggs, somebody, <laughs> the top dogs in Nashville would just be shaking, you know, around Earl Scruggs. He just had that, even when he was older, you know, he just kind of really? had that uh, everybody had so much respect for him. He's such a giant in American music and he was so humble and totally chill, you know, but man, I've seen people just like shaking in their boots around him. Wow. You know? So anyway, it was always a fun night at his birthday parties. Um, and then a few years ago, um, so when I did this first record with Trey Hensley called Before okay. the Sun Goes Down, um, I was doing a TV show um, and Vince was on it and, uh, and Steve Warner also. And so we were just hanging out in the green room and Vince came all the way across the room and shook my hand and said, Rob, I got to tell you, I love that record that you did with Trey Hensley. I said, I, he said, I've had it in my CD player for months now. I just listened to it over and over again. Wow. And I was like, well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Trey's amazing and we're having a blast, you know. And uh, so when we were finishing our second album, we went and sat in with the Time Jumpers, which is- Oh you yeah, know, the Vince's band. Place with Nashville. Andy Reese. And uh, so we were just talking after the gig and, uh, and uh, he just came up and started going on about it. He said, I've, I cannot, you know, I've been listening to that record over and over again. And I said, well, we're finishing our second one right now. We're going to need some tenor on there, you know, some harmony vocals. He said, I'd love to, man. So he sang on our second album and then he sang on our new album also. Uh, did a great job on a Grateful Dead tune. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I've known him eh, quite a while now, you know, but uh, and just been a huge fan of his forever. So, yeah, he's the coolest. It's so nice that you've um, earned your way into, as you said, playing with these people that you admire. That's got to, man, that's got to feel great. It does, man. It's, uh, it's uh, I mean, it's, you know, uh, it's, 
it, like you said, it's all about progress and, you know, working on your thing. But I do like, I don't like, I don't think about it till I do an interview or something. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's not like you're, you're like, uh, <laughs> oh my God, but it like, um, to have earned your way into that, like when you get the call, you got to be like, wow, that is so freaking cool. Yeah. And then you may yeah. prop it, never consider it again. But at that moment, it's got to oh, feel great. Yeah. It's exciting. It's, yeah. It's exciting. Sure. That's awesome. And I think, you know, music's so weird. You're just so critical of yourself and, and, uh, but yeah, to have, to have somebody you admire, enjoy what you do is yeah, as the ultimate compliment really. Yeah. And most musicians are like that though. Um, are very, very humble. You know, they're, well, I think we all know it's, it's, uh, I don't know. It's like, it's just, it's always a challenge, you know, I mean, it's a blast and everything, but, but it's, it's, uh, uh you're, you're never, uh, and there's funny, there's times when, when you think you didn't do great and you hear it later, it's like, it's great. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so there's a mind, there's a mind thing that's that every artist, you know, goes through. And so I think that's what keeps you humble, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Uh, Vince Gill goes, man, I could have sang that better. You know, when he comes on stage, <laughs> you know, you're yeah. going, oh my God best singing I've ever heard um and I heard a funny quote one of my favorite musicians is Stuart Duncan a great fiddle player he plays everything but um he uh I was working with him a couple weeks ago and he he was overdubbing on it actually a track we did with Taj Mahal recently and and uh, Stuart was playing fiddle on it and he came in and we, everybody was just like that was great pitch I mean fiddle is tough you know it's like Dobro for pitch is risky business you know and and the engineer said you just always play in tune and and Stuart said well you know I heard a classical violinist say um, that I don't play in tune I just fix it before you hear it <laughs> that's great and I, I don't play and in I tune know what, I know what he means man it's kind of like the dope rose the same way because you will be doing these things and you'll make these slight adjustments by the seat of your pants you know and so and you will kind of count it as a mistake. But when you listen to it later, yes, it flew by, you know. Yeah. And so our ears are so in tune to it, and you're so critical that sometimes we hear it as a mistake, but nobody else does. I guess right. that's you know what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I totally get that, man. It's but scary. I, I, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go down that path. <laughs> yeah, you can get out. Yeah, there's a lot of, and almost everybody I've talked to as well has some degree of like imposter syndrome. Like, I hope I don't get outed. Yeah. Even the, but, yeah. you know, fantastically successful and it comes out, it comes out right before you walk on stage. <laughs> yeah. That's what I hear. That's what I hear. But it's, I gone. What, it's gone most of the time, but then right before you walk out on stage, it pops in there. It pops in your head. That's wild. But that's what I love about, to be honest with you, that's what I like so much about the, in, do, in the music community, all the people I've met, everybody is so humble and like, um, you know, it's not, I, I, it's how do you not enjoy talking to people that are like really good at what they do yet very grounded i mean you know that's nice to yeah it's just a good vibe you know yeah, yeah. it's true and i i've heard it too I mean, when i first moved here Stuart duncan again one of my heroes you know one of the first records i played on in town and he was playing and he was just really complaining about his solo on this <laughs> song <laughs> And I thought, oh my God, if this guy's complaining, there's no hope for any of us because he's yeah. he can't on the planet, you know. But uh, yeah, you know, it just so that's so I think that can all contributes to the humility that you're talking about among artists, you know. For sure. Uh, David Grisman, how'd you connect with him? I met him when I was kind of a kid still. I was living in the Bay Area. And um, I had a friend uh, named Joe Craven, who's an amazing musician, plays everything. And he played with David for many years. And so, um, I don't know, I think Joe invited me to sit in with them. Uh, he told David about me. And, uh, and so they were doing a show somewhere in Marin County. David lives in Marin, or he did at that time. And uh, as a festival, and I went out and got up on stage and sat in on the last couple of songs, and it went great, and David loved it, and he, he told me later, he said, anytime I'm on stage, you can come on. Wow. <laughs> so I was like, That's pretty cool. Okay. I, I think I was probably 18 or 19 or something. 
Uh, and, uh, and then I did some recording at his studio there in California. That was a lot of fun. Probably some of my first times in a recording studio, actually. But yeah, I mean, he's been a big influence musically. I mean, he, uh, I don't know if you've listened to my solo records, you know, yes. they're pretty, I mean, I started out just in the bluegrass and then kind of have spread out since there. When I went to college, I got really into jazz and blues and et cetera. And I started listening to Miles Davis and B.B. King and, you know, Robin Ford and uh, Larry Carlton and John Schofield. A lot of jazz guys, really, a lot of guitar players. Um, and uh, what was your question? <laughs> Oh, do you were talking about Grisman, how you got involved with it. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you started talking about how you started branching out from solely bluegrass. So when I listened to David's music or Tony Rice, or they did a lot right. of stuff together, they would, you know, I read interviews with them. They talk about Miles Davis and John Coltrane. Right. And I said, well, what's up with that? You know, so I started listening to those guys on their recommendation. I started listening to the Coltrane and, and Miles. And uh, wow. And now, and it's funny, I can hear the precision, you know, like when you listen to Tony Rice, you don't hear the, the note choices so much. It's not like he's, it's not like he transcribed a bunch of Miles Davis solos or John Coltrane, but the rhythm and the purity of tone, he definitely soaked that up from listening to those guys. Mm. Um, and so, and I just liked that hybrid, you know, Davis music is kind of bluegrass and jazz. And yeah. Django Reinhardt, you know, swing. And, uh, but there's something about exploring that brought this energy, you know? I mean, those guys were so on fire, especially the first few albums, you know? It's just like, blow your mind, so good. And, um, and so, you know, I guess as a, even as a kid, I went, it's important to be on the cutting edge. It's important to push yourself. Um, it creates some kind of energy, you know, it's important to play with other people who push themselves and who want to be on the cutting edge, you know. Um, and so I learned, so I feel like those are a lot of lessons I learned from David. Also tone and producing, you know, he's a great producer. And I would read articles. Again, I was a kid, I used to read, read Fretz magazine all the time, sure. if you're familiar with that. Um, and guys would talk about I remember an interview with Jerry Douglas and he said he loved working with David Grisman because he would say, just do your thing. But right here, I want you to do this. <laughs> and it gave the piece of shit. I knew exactly what Jerry was talking about from listening to David's music because he's got these great melodies and you have to play the melody. But when it's your solo, man, have a gas, you know, yeah. do whatever you want. And I like that sort of a plan, but a loose plan. And I think that that creates a nice structure to music where it's not, everything's not written out but there's enough written out to make it sort of intellectually interesting but there's some soulful playing where nobody's hemmed in and has to play these exact notes they're improvising and there's some energy happening so i like that as a cook you know he cooked up yeah. a lot of good good for us you know very very good man yorma how did you I mean, he's one of my i mean i'm such a fan of his since the, the, the airplane days what a guitarist man and he's yeah. and now of course what he does acoustically is like just mind-blowing but how did you guys connect so he was a big fan of blue highway the bluegrass band yeah and so i kind of think that's how we met he maybe we did his maybe we did a concert at fur peace ranch his camp out there. yeah right in ohio there yeah I can't remember, but somebody just told us he's a huge fan. And then maybe we did a concert and then he asked us to play on his record. So I think the second record he did in Nashville. That's so, so cool, man. He played on one or two tracks and he, I mean, he's a fan. Uh, he loves Blue Highway and we love him, man. And it was just really fun to hang with him. He's such a great person. Uh, he's been through a lot, you know, and he's still out there doing it, you know, 50 plus years, you know, and still playing and singing great. And so when Trey Hensley and I started playing together, I told, uh, I think I just emailed, emailed Yorma and I said, man, I think you're going to dig this guitar play, <laughs> man, it's amazing. And, uh, oh, cool. I'll check it out, you know, and, um, and uh and then a little while after that we were played at folk alliance a couple years ago which is a big convention and they have a lot of showcases 
And so I noticed that we were playing right after Yorma, like on Saturday night in one of the nice, nicer venues, you know. And uh, so I told him, I said, hey, I think we're playing right after you, man. Hope we get a visit in. And I'd, I'd love for you to hear this guy, Trey, man. He's going to blow your mind. And, okay, cool. Yeah, sounds good. And so um, I didn't see this, but after our show that night, uh, somebody told me he just sat there in the front row with his jaw <laughs> hanging wow. open, you know. And really loved it. And we had a nice visit after the show, you know. And uh, and so soon after that, uh, they booked us at his ranch, you know. And we did a show and taught up there. And um, and then we opened a bunch of shows for Hot Tuna last summer. And that was oh, amazing. that's cool. Was this like which is him and uh, Jack or, uh, or? It was the band. It was the, the Electric band. Hot Tuna. Yeah. Oh, dude, I saw them like eight or nine years ago down here. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I've seen so them like two did. or three times, but. Yeah, yeah. So I guess just a trio. Just yeah, Jack, Jack and Yorma, and this great drummer named Justin Gwynn. Okay. Uh, and so he did a lot of stuff with Lee Von Helm. He's he's a great okay. producer. Okay. Great. Okay. Drummer. And so we have really just clicked in the last couple of years, and so I'm hoping to do some more stuff with him. We're supposed to play with him again in September. You know, who knows what the world's going to be like then. But yeah, uh, but yeah so that's a great relationship that is, uh, you know, looks like there's some more stuff coming out of that. So that's great. And, and Trey, Trey and Yorma are pals. They love, love hanging out and picking together. And um, so that's been a really great relationship. So I just like him, you know, when we taught up there last summer, I took my wife and, um, you know, your uh, Yorma's wife is great, and we just we just had a nice hang, you know. So it's like the music's fun, the hang is great, and uh, what more can you ask for? <laughs> Nothing, man. That's exactly right. Yeah, I could yeah. see Trey and Yorma. That's got to be pretty scary, like watching those two. It is. Yeah, go on YouTube and check it out. There's yeah, some I'm, stuff wow. from what we did uh, this summer on YouTube. Yeah, we did a great show at the Caverns, which is this cool venue in Tennessee. It's actually a cave underground. And, uh, and yeah, yeah, we sat in with those guys at the end of their set every night. And so that was fun. And we played electric, so I played lap steel. Oh, that's great. I played Yorma's Firebird, which was pretty cool. Did you? Yeah, he, <laughs> he's, a, he's a phenomenal music. I mean, just an incredible player, man. So soulful. So, so yeah cool. yeah yeah great great player so he's you know what it, you know i i read his book last year too and it's just like biblical you know just all the stuff he's been through man he's had an amazing journey so he's uh just somebody that i learned from just watching and hanging out with him i learned a lot you know that's awesome man all right now fix this man david lee roth what the <laughs> That was not, I was not expecting to see that name there. Like well, that's another, just like a weird phone call, you know? Um, and so there was this label CMH They're They're still, they're still going. I think you're out of Los Angeles and they were doing a lot of these picking on records, you know, where it's like picking on the Dixie chicks, basically instrumental versions, you know, of a lot of these hit records. And I have played on a bunch of them. Um, and so they were doing one, that was basically, well, it wasn't picking, it was a tribute to Van Halen, but they okay. wanted all these bluegrass, you know, artists and, you know, so they, they hired Blue Highway um, to, to, to pick a song and do it, you know, so we did. And then um, John Cowan, I don't know if you know him, but he's this amazing singer here in Nashville. Did he play with... Uh... Was he in a, a Doobie Brothers now? But he was in Newgrass Revival. Right, Newgrass Revival. Right, because I had uh, Pat Flynn on. Oh scene. yeah, yeah, man, that's it. That's yeah, it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I knew I knew that name. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so John's like this rock and roll, amazing vocalist who was in. You know, it wasn't really a bluegrass band. They were the most progressive bluegrass band you could ever have. You yeah. Know, ben Black and Sam Bush and Pat Flynn and John Count. So anyway, um, so they got. Got John to sing a couple tracks and I so it was like a studio band and I was on those tracks and I'm trying to remember the exact story this may not be exactly the deal but it was my understanding that David Lee Roth's sister works for this record label and he was gonna sing one song one of these tracks that we that we did for John Cowan mm. and he just flipped out when he heard these tracks he freaking loved it and he said I want to sing on more than just one man this is great and so, uh, so we ended up, uh, he ended up singing on three or four tracks 
And when the record came out, we did a bunch of TV stuff to promote the record. And wow. uh, we did Letterman and Leno and uh, The View, a few other things. We did Conan. Um, and uh, it was just, we were just all just crack it up, you know, because every, all these players were great. You know, John Jorgensen was one. He was. Oh yeah. I had John on the show. Fantastic. Yeah. Player, man. yeah, yeah. So he was playing mandolin, I think. And then um, Scott Vestal on banjo, one of the best banjo players on the planet. So it was a great band. And uh, we just kept laughing because of course we're, all, you know, we were, we're mainly known as bluegrass musicians, but hell, we all grew up with Van Halen. You know? Yeah. So we, right. we, we after the shows, we just like look at each other like, can you believe this, man? We're playing banjo and dobro with with uh, with David Lee Roth. And That's David funny. Lee was a prince, man. He was just awesome and treated us great and was really fun. And uh, it was an amazing experience. And I just, I love to have that on my resume. <laughs> yeah, very cool. You know what? I bet one thing is clear to me. And uh, again, something that you probably ought to feel great about is Let's face it, no few people when they're charting, what do I need? Think of Dobro, unless you're in that space. Yeah. I bet this is what's really, I, I have a lot of, you know, give you a lot of credit for. You probably, because of what you do, have made space for yourself where people think about you when they otherwise wouldn't. And that is really a great accomplishment. Well, you know, I think one thing that was always important to me, well, not always, but after I've been playing a few years, just the importance of having your own sound, you know? And yeah. It's, it's a challenge. I mean, people ask me that all the time, how do I get my own sound? How did you get your sound? You know, I don't know. <laughs> but it wasn't, I think you have to sort of like mentally tell yourself, I'm going to get my own sound, you know? I think most people, I, I was thinking about this the other day, most people that play professionally, uh we don't go to school per se you know what i mean i mean in this music you know not classical music obviously yeah. but in most musics the way the way real players learn is by imitating you know when i work with these other amazing players in town if you say hey play a reggie young solo you know hey play a you know um you know, Mark Knopfler solo or play a, you know, uh, Brent Mason solo, whatever. Um, that's how we learn, you know, we learn by ear, we learn by imitating records. Yeah. And that's how I learned. And, but at some point I realized that I didn't want to sound just like Mike Aldridge. I didn't want to sound just like Jerry Douglas or Josh Graves. What do I sound like? And um, again, my friend Ron Block, who I mentioned earlier, plays with Alison Krauss. He was big on that, you know, and he was a big influence on me. And he was, he played bluegrass guitar, but he loved, uh, he, he almost, he didn't listen to Tony Rice because everybody else was listening to Tony Rice. <laughs> right. So he listened to Larry Sparks and Larry Carlton and, you know, B.B. King and brought that into his bluegrass guitar playing, you know. Um, and so I just kind of imitated him. <laughs> uh, and and I, I began to listen to the other instruments and incorporate them into the dobro. So when I play rhythm, I can make it sound like a mandolin. Uh, I can make it sound like a fiddle, you know. Um, and so, so at some point, so, so we, I think a lot of us that play professionally start by imitating, but you've got to leave the nest at some point and find your own sound. And I think listening to other instruments really helped me do that a lot. And, um, and, and yeah, so I think people hear a sound, this, this needs the dobro, it needs Rob or whatever, you know? And so I think it's important to have your own sound is what I'm trying to say. I guess. Yeah. And, and the nice thing is you didn't do that because, oh man, I, if I do this, I'll make more money. You did that because I want to be better. Yeah. You know, it was the love of, I want to be better. I want to be able to be a better player. I want to be more versatile. I want to be able to serve the songs better. The side effect, not knowing that when you're woodshedding an extra 10 hours a week on this specific thing is you're going to make more money and it doesn't happen right away, of course, but you do. That's ultimately what happens. It's just, you know, I, the longer I'm, the older I get and the more I talk with musicians, the more 
greater importance this has become in my life and even to talk to my kids about things of, of the right reason for doing things. I mean, right, right. What I feel is right. You know, there's no right really in the big world. Um, and it, and it just feels so much better when you do the things that, when you do it that way that you did, you know, out of the sheer joy of, you know, I think it starts, you know, when you're a kid, you, you hear this, you're drawn towards this purity in music and you can, you know, I remember taking art classes or history of music, you know, when I was a kid or in college and, you know, and you talk about great artists and pursuing the truth, you know, and, and it's in some ways it's nebulous, but in some ways it's the whole, whole thing. Yeah. And what I'm, what I mean by that is, I, even as a kid, I could sense when I listened to Tony Rice and David Grisman that they were onto something real. <laughs> Whatever it is, you can't right. put your finger on it. But I could feel it, you know. And so, as an artist, that's the kind of music that I would like to do, you know, something where maybe you can't really define, but you hear something real. And it's, it's about truth. And, and I think your truth and your motives in your music is very important. And if, yeah. you're, not on, if you're not honest, it, it comes out, man. It, it, you're going to sound like you're not honest. I don't know. It just it, your music won't be as powerful, you know. Um, the connection so is going to be not as strong. I don't think the connect yeah. between you and the music. And if, if it's between you and the music, then, of course, between the listeners and the music. And that's probably the thing I hate listening to the most, you know, is when I hear something on the radio or a record or whatever, and I can just hear that the artist or the guitar player or the bass player was not all there. Yeah. And I can't, I can't put a finger on what it is, but it's just like this feeling comes over me and I have to change the channel, you know? Yeah. Um, and as a musician, the more you play, you get more sensitive to it. I think as a listener, you pick up on it too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But when you play, you're like super sensitive to that stuff. And I remember reading an interview with Pat Metheny like a long time ago. And he was, you know, I said, what kind of music do you like? Who do you, who do you like? You know, and he said, well, I don't know. I could be in the grocery store listening to music and I don't like it, but then I'll hear this guitar solo. And if it's a killer guitar solo, I don't like that. You know, if it has that spirit. And, right. and I think I listen in a similar way, you know, um, I'm looking for a spirit of, something that gets me excited, something that goes inside you, you know, yeah. like Mike Aldridge, you know, I mean, that's why we're doing this, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's funny. But I don't know about, no, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say it's nebulous. You can't, you know, put your finger on it or I can't tell you exactly what I'm hearing because it's just a feeling, but we all kind of know it's there, you know? Yes. And like, I think what I was going to say is when I hear, like I have three kids and they've all gone through musical and sometimes they'll be listening to something and I just want to like, psh, psh, like that is fake. What do you, I mean, this is awful. It's just so contrived. It's like, you know, and it, yeah. and it, it, is. it just sounds awful. It's like some, it's like, it's, I can't even say it's formulaic, but it's just awful. There's no soul in it, you know? Yeah. 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 It's really weird. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's very uh, what's yeah. that? Yeah, it's, oh, it's probably subjective to what we're talking about, but you know, it is, right? I think you know, you know what I guess what you're searching for, you know. Yeah, you know? totally. Um, it's an interesting story how you and Trey first connected. If you could share that, because I know you mentioned you played on the record together, but that's not what the spark was. Yeah, show. it is really interesting. Uh, well, I mean, we probably met when he well, we met when he was a kid, and I was playing with Earl Scruggs. And we had a show at the uh, Tennessee Theater in Knoxville. And uh, Trey had met Earl Scruggs a few months earlier on the Opry because uh, Marty Stewart had heard Trey playing uh, and was really impressed. Like I said, Trey was only 11 or 12 at that time. And Marty invited Trey to sit in with his band and that went great. So then he invited him to do the Opry with them a few weeks later. Oh, and wow. at that show, uh, Earl Scrugg Marty also brought Earl Scruggs out on stage and surprised Trey, you know. That's um, so whenever, so a few months later, we played in Knoxville and Trey sat in with the band and I thought, oh, that was great, man. The kid's really good, you know. And heck, you know, and now I found out now that he'd only been playing guitar for a few months, you know. I read that. That was mind-blowing, man. Yeah. Yeah. And um, 
so that's when we met and then he sat in with blue highway a few times he's from east tennessee which is where a lot of the guys from blue highway live okay and so you know that band's kind of an institution at this point you know out there and so so trey would sit in with us some and um and then i didn't see him for a number of years and then um a few years ago we were doing a blue highway album and we had this one song that we were going to send to a, a bluegrass star you know as a guest artist but we needed somebody to sing a scratch vocal so that we could all play live and then uh, and then just replace the scratch vocal with the guest artist. And uh, so we needed somebody outside of the band to do that because if you're singing and playing at the same time, you'd have to remove an instrument, you know, because the vocal would lead onto the instrument mic. Sure. So, uh, so the guy who runs the studio says, I'll call Trey Hensley, he lives nearby, he'll do a great job, you know. So the next day Trey came in and it was an original and it wasn't like, it was a, you know, it was a, it wasn't like something everybody, it was a brand new song. And so he'd never heard it before and we gave him the lyrics and sang it to him once and we went in there and he freaking killed it, man. Yeah, I, he's got a great voice. He sang it so well. And so, but we didn't even really, we, weren't, we were just kind of focused on the track that day. So after it was done, we said, great job, man. Thank you. Here, you know, here's some dough appreciate it and so then the engineer made some rough mixes a couple days later and we all started listening to these rough mixes and we just we couldn't believe how good the vocal was you know and we said there's nobody going to sing this song any better than what that kid just did right and uh and so we decided to leave that vocal on our record you know and make trey the guest artist you know that's um, really cool yeah yeah and so so after he sang the vocal, um, you know, I just, honestly, I just became, I just became a huge fan. You know, I, like I said, I didn't really know what he was doing. I, I would hear his name from time to time again, cause he's kind of friends of friends in that area. And, um, and so I told the guy who owns studio, I said, you know, what's Trey doing right now? And he said, well, he's just kind of playing around locally. And I said, well, if he ever needs help with his music, just tell him to call me. I think he's an amazing singer, you know? And, and then the guy's like, well, check, check out his guitar playing. And he sent me some YouTube clips, you know, and I went, oh my God, this guy is a guitar god. I mean, yeah. he is really an amazing guitar player. And so, uh, and I said, well, tell him if he ever needs help or advice or anything, just a mentor or whatever, you know, tell him to call me. So Trey called me a couple of days later. And it's funny, we had this long talk and I, I kind of, I didn't, you know, I kind of poo-pooed the music business in some ways. I didn't want to sugarcoat it. You know, I was being yeah. honest. With them. And I said, you know, it's a tough biz. You know, you're gone a lot and you're married. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it, if anybody, I told them, anybody you like musically has given their whole life to it. And it, it will take your whole life out of you. So you got to be careful, you know. But having said all that, I think you're amazing and you could do some serious damage. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, my wife and I have been thinking about moving to Nashville. Um, I was but, just going to say, I hope you tell him you got to move out of East Tennessee, <laughs> yet, man, because it ain't going to happen there. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I don't even know if I said that, but I just said, you know, obviously there's a lot more going on here. But he, I think he just said that pretty early on that they were thinking about moving okay. here. I said, well, if you do, I would love to introduce you to some people and get you going because I think you're amazing. You wow, know? that was really kind of you, man. Well, it was just kind of, you know, it was just, just it was, I don't do that. <laughs> I don't think I've ever extended myself. I have helped other people, but not like this guy. I was so impressed with him, you know. And, um, and so he called me back the very next day and he said, you're not going to believe this, but my wife got, she, had, she applied yesterday and they want, they've already accepted her and we're going to look at apartments next week. That's, I, said, wow. that, I said, that's great. When you guys get settled, call me and we'll start getting you, you know, introduce you around. We'll start playing the station in, which is the big bluegrass club in town, you know? And I said, I, I'd love to help you get going. And so, um, so that's what we did. And, um, and we ended up doing an album together just that first fall that he lived here. Um, and it just, all these doors started opening, you know, and we were just a good team and I, I liked the music we were doing. And I was kind of getting, it's funny, right before we started working together, I was kind of feeling like I was ready to do something else musically, you know, like I Blue Highway is a great gig and they're the best guys in the world. But just musically, I was just feeling like, 
I'm really feeling like doing something different, you know. And then when Trey moved here, we started playing together. Just all these fireworks went off musically, and and we just get along great, you know. And so, um, yeah. So at some point, uh, I just told him, I said, "Man, I'd love to make this my main gig if you want to do it." And he said, "This is the best gig I've ever had." Wow. And I, said, I said, "Well, shit, let's do it," you know. So um, and then right after that, our first record was released. And he got nominated for a Grammy. So that was a nice kick, you know, uh, to our careers. Um, and we've just been rolling ever since. You know, we, uh, we've had Ben sing on a couple of our records. And uh, we got with Vector Management uh, a couple of years ago. And so they're doing great stuff for us. We've been working with Yorma and Taj Mahal also. Really excited about what we're doing with Taj. Um, and Tommy Emanuel, you know, so it's just these doors keep opening. So and we're just having a blast. So it just feels like uh you know everything's going going really well yeah at least it's like validation that you know the universe is telling you hey man you made the right decision here well it was a serious gut feeling and i know now i know why they call it a gut feeling because i really felt it in my gut you know it's just telling me this is what you need to do you know and so uh but it's a it was a big step for me i mean you know, the dobro, it's not, like I said earlier, it's not like every band has a, it's not every band has a bass band, but every band doesn't have a dobro. So yeah. It's a, a limited number of gigs out there. And, um, and uh, so it was a big leap, but yeah, yeah. I feel like we've reached the other side and it's, uh, things are going pretty well, man. So it's been good. Well, deservedly so, man. The music was great <laughs> and well put together. Thank you. Um, Anything you're looking forward to doing outside of playing after COVID? <laughs> it's funny because my wife and I had like a week book at this place we go down in Florida, right when this started, man. And, uh, and my daughter uh, was in London doing her s sophomore spring semester over there. That's nice. And so we didn't know what the heck was going on. So we canceled our trip. And then my daughter ended up coming home early. Um, and she's zooming her classes right now, you know. So this is her last week. Um, so anyway, I'd like to go down to Florida <laughs> when this is over. Uh, it's been interesting. Where do, you, where do you go in Florida? We like to go to Cape Sand Blast. It's kind of by Apalachicola. Oh, up in up north. Yeah, because you're in yeah. Florida, right? Yeah, I'm in Tampa, right? right. Oh, right on. Yeah, yeah, I love Tampa too. Yeah, yeah. it's fun here. Yeah. It's yeah, this is, no, it's quiet. I mean, I don't like Destin and all the hotels and stuff. And so this place, they call it old, it's like old Florida. Yeah, yeah. you got the, the the pristine, you know, the visuals yeah. and the setting, but without all the, the traffic. Yeah. There's no hotels down there, man. You just rent a house on the beach. And That's cool. Out, and we cook and stuff, you know, and there's one little restaurant at the end of the Cape Sand Blast that's fun. And so it's very relaxing. So that's kind of where we go. Pretty that's relaxed. awesome. Funny, we, we've been sitting around so much. I don't really know that we'll want to go down there and sit around. <laughs> I know. It's weird. Like you want to get away, but you want to get away and like be busy or something like that. Yeah, it is definitely weird, man. It is, it is weird. Um, it's funny. You just, you know, it's been shedding a lot, you know, and, and uh, when you play professionally, you just like everybody thinks you play all the time, but you're too, you're just traveling or, or going to a session or I don't know, you don't have, you really don't have big chunks of time to get into your work on your stuff, you know, yeah. so I plan to do that. So that's been good. Good, man. Well, hopefully it'll be over. It's re I was talking to my wife today. I was saying something about, I don't know what she was talking about. So I was saying something about musicians. Or she says, Craig, that, that may not happen for a year. And I'm like, what? I know. I know. Because, well, cause like Disney world is closed till 2021. Yeah. At a minimum. Yeah. Man, how do you stop? I mean, it's probably, you know, 80, 90,000 employees there. We just got an offer for a gig in Gallup, New Mexico at the end of July, believe it or not, for this year. So I'm like, God bless you, man. Right on. Bravest promoter in the world, man. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know if we'll do it or not. But um, yeah, man, it's been interesting. Everything's gone pretty much through mid August, and we had a great <laughs> year coming up. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're going to do our first live stream on Thursday night. And um, let's see. Uh, it's nice with the duo, you know, because we just have to get me and him together. So right. do you have to pretend like pretend like you're social distancing on on the 
like the video? Well, do you have to- we haven't done it yet. And so it's a good question. My daughter was, I told my daughter we were going to do this. And she said, you better, you better be six feet apart because people, when they do it online, if they're not, they get a lot of comments. You know, if you're, if you're, cl- if you're doing right. it closer together. And so, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll stay six feet apart. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Man. How bizarre is that, right? Isn't that weird? It is bizarre. It is hey man, bizarre. But don't come too close. Like you're playing music. It's so weird. I know. I know. Go figure. But I think it's, you know, we're all just going to have to make changes. And our, our manager's like, well, on the good side, you know, they expect the smaller venues to come back before the auditoriums, you know, the, the yeah. and stuff. And so maybe we'll get back to work before staying in the Rolling Stones, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, they got a little more flexibility anyway, so I think that's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they probably waited out longer than we can. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, and I think a lot of it's going to go online. Like I said, I have that teaching website. And yeah. So yeah. that's, that's kind of nice to figure out, you know, how can I make some money without – traveling at this point and i think more of it's going to move on it was already going online but i think you know more of what we do is going to move online in the future um and you know i think it'll be a weird year or two years even um but you know i think the world i think obviously we're going to survive and it'll be a different a different reality but man we're going to get through it and of course, yeah of course music is so important to people and i don't think i realized that i remember after 9-11 you know, we had some shows the next weekend and we didn't know, should we cancel or what? And the promoter wasn't sure either. And he said, let's just do it, you know. And we played in Memphis, I'll never forget. And it was a packed house. And you could just feel that people were so happy to get out of the house, you know, and the news, you know. And, um, And so I always underestimate, you know, the power that music is in people's lives. I know it's a big power in my life. Yeah, um, but it's very, very important for us to get out and do what we do for people, you know. So uh, totally, it's way way more important than I I even realize most of the time. So we will get back and we'll we'll. I'm just gonna work on my craft for now, man. And be- That's scary. How many more? <laughs> how many more awards are you gonna win, man? That's pretty. Uh, Rob, let me ask you this: What were some of the low points, maybe, or darker periods you've had to deal with, and how'd you get through them? I was trying to think, um, you know, moving to Nashville, I mean, it wasn't dark, but I tell you, it was, it was literally rice and beans, you know, for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> I had, my dad passed away about a year ago and oh, I, Oh, sorry, uh, man. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, but I, I, he, he's around his 80th birthday and for his 80th, I wrote him a little poem and that was one of the things I put in there. It was that, uh, the poem was called why, my dad is way cooler than all of you, everybody else's dad. <laughs> and just a bunch of memories, you know, of cool yeah. stuff my dad did, you know, for me. And uh, one of them was, one memory I have is that when I left to Nashville, so I was living in California. I, I went to UC Davis and graduated there. And, you know, I was playing, but I didn't have much going on. And I had my mom's, you know, like 79 Honda Civic. I was driving and I, so I was moving to Nashville and I had friends that lived here in Franklin and they, they kept telling me, come on out here. You can stay with us, you know, to get your feet on the ground. And, and so I finally just took them up on the offer. So November 92, I packed up my stuff and, uh, I was living in Davis at the time. So I went down to my parents' house and, uh, spent the, in the Bay area mm. and, uh, finished loading up. And got in the car. My dad stuck two hundred bucks in my pocket, and that was that was about wow. that was two hundred bucks more than I had in my pocket. That was and, so cool. Uh, and uh, sent me on my way, you know. And uh, but uh, it's funny, you know. Uh, later on, I mean, he was. They, both my parents were always very supportive for the most part. But I've heard things in the last few years, just like that. You know, my dad really was proud of me and he would tell me but you know when you hear other people tell you oh your dad said this or that that was uh that was pretty cool uh that's cool i didn't you know you know you don't talk to your dad about that stuff usually we're both we're both we don't really go there so um so that was a thrill to hear but um but anyway so when i first moved out here you know i was living with friends and um 
but and I had some good stuff, but you know, not a lot of it. <laughs> sure, sure. And so just kind of again, just kind of preparing for when the good stuff comes in and working on your craft, you know. But I just remember the question mark, you know, am I good enough or am I the guy or could I be the guy or could I be one of the guys, you know, all those questions. You don't know how good you are, you know, like say you don't know how tall you are till you get in over your head, you know. Yeah. Well, it's a lot of uncertainty, man. And, you know, especially in Nashville, you, it's not like people suck there. They're the best of the best of the best. Yes. And for me, I mean, if you move from East Tennessee to Nashville or North Carolina, it's not as big a deal, but I mean, California is like a different planet. Huge. Yeah. For me to, to make that move was a big decision. And it's also all your friends and your family, you know, my, my parents had a going away party for me, you know, Oh, that's nice. But yeah. It's great. But it's kind of like, Oh shit, man, the pressure is on here, you know, and yeah, yeah everybody wants you to do good, but some people are, you know, it's the other thing with music. People, they, they, some people are down on it, especially when you're young. They don't want you to go do it. They don't want you to take the risk. Um, and like I said, my parents were always pretty supportive. Um, but uh, so it's it's a lot of weird emotions, you know, at that time. But uh, but so but luckily, you know, like I said, I started getting work, and I I joined, uh, you know, a few bands, or I would sit in, or or sub with people when I first moved out here. And then once I got in Blue Highway, man, things really opened up for me. And that's awesome. Uh, and just kind of been going since then. So yeah. Thank you, man. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I want to talk about music a little bit. Uh the last the record that you just did with Trey, uh World Full of Blues, it has mostly originals on it, but over the last two records, you guys have done some really cool covers. Like you've covered the Allman Brothers, you've mentioned Grateful Dead, Robin Ford, Elton John. Uh, some of these songs are well known, like I think the Dead tune, if I remember, and the brother, Allman Brothers. But others were deep cuts, like Elton John, Ballad of a Well-Known Gun. I love that track. That's a deep track, man. You, they're not playing that usually. How do you decide what you want to cover? great question you know uh, we basically just throw songs at each other you know and and I guess that's what I mean when we first started working together it was a lot of fireworks you know we just kind of were on the same page about it. we both liked lots of different styles of music and uh, Cray, uh, Trey as young as he is um, he's got incredibly big ears and what I mean by that is he's so you know he knows every Pink Floyd song every Flat and Scrugg song, every Allman Brothers song, every Merle Haggard song, every, you know. Yeah, has, way back. He has done his homework, a wide variety of genres, you know. And um, so, and I love that too, because I'm the same way. I think he's, 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 he's more, he's got bigger ears than I do, you know. He really, he's, he's more, fam he's familiar with more musical styles than I am by a long shot. And um, he... So anyway, so we'll just throw songs at each other, man. And it's funny because on our second record, we did uh, Friend of the Devil, which is pretty well known. Great. Yeah. That song. But the funny thing is that, hell, I'd never heard it before. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, it's pretty popular. Because I'm not up on my dead stuff. And Trey is, you know. And but So when he brought it to me, it was like a new song. And I loved it, you know. <laughs> and I, I kind of came up with this riff and this arrangement. And um and uh, and then only later did I find out that oh yeah man it, it, this this is a this was this is a huge song you know everybody knows this song by them uh, but it made a it fit what we did so perfectly yeah with the picking for sure yeah, yeah that, that yeah. song break, in particular break, yeah break it down into this improv thing you know where we just kind of try to explode our instruments pretty much by the end of the song but yeah. you see it live you know uh, it was kind of a lot of cool stuff that happens in that song, a lot of free kind of free form improvisation. Um, but, you know, just throwing stuff at each other and, and a lot of stuff he throws at me, I, I like, and a lot of stuff I throw at him, he likes. So it's not like he throws something at me and I gotta go, oh, I don't know, I'm not feeling that. R yeah. Rarely does that happen and I think vice versa. So I think that's what, you know, th that's what makes it click, you know, where we're, and again, it's not, it doesn't have to be one style or one thing. You know, he brought that Elton John song. And uh, I don't know if he played it or if he played me, you know, if he played it himself or if he played me Elton's version. I think he probably just sang it himself. And I, again, I hadn't heard Elton's version. And so for me, it was like a new song. Right. Heck yeah, man. I love the lyrics and the story it tells. That fits this instrumentation freaking perfectly. 
so it's just been a lot of, um, and I feel like we've only scratched the surface of what we could do musically, you know? So uh, it's a very open-ended project in that, you know, sky's the limit and we can do whatever we want to do. So that's, that's pretty fun. <laughs> that's wonderful, man. Um, anything you haven't done yet that you'd like to do or anyone you haven't played with yet that you'd like to play with? Well, sure. I mean, I love Bonnie Raitt, you know, and Eric Clapton and, um, you know, but honestly, when I worked with Merle Haggard, that was the best. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's not going to get any better than that, you know, because, he was such a, a huge inspiration to me from even before I started playing. You know, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, I just remember sitting at a traffic light when I was probably in, in your mom's car. Yeah. In seventh grade or something, you know, and Kern River came on and even as a little kid, I'm like, Holy crap. <laughs> Who is his guitar player then? Well, on um, there, there's a, actually, it's funny because there's a great Dobro solo on that song by his steel player, Norm Hamlet. And there's a, just a, killer tasty little dough that's the only solo is, is a dobro solo so it's funny again i think this was before i started playing dobro that song hit me like a ton of bricks you know yeah but uh and it's funny in nashville you know when you talk to the musicians a lot of times like how's it going and then oh pretty good i played with this and i produced that and then i'm on tour with this and you know you get the everybody's resume you know and uh, there's a lot of name dropping that goes on but you know Merle, when you say Merle Haggard, you you win. It's like checking. You win. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> it's like nobody says anything. Right. Like, what are you going to say? Come back to that. Well, yeah. Uh, but you know, for me personally, anyway, he was uh, a hero. You know, he was like a god. He was like American history. You know, not just music, <laughs> but like America. It's like Abe Lincoln and Merle. Yeah. Haggard, you, know? Uh, you know, in my brain, anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, I love Pat Metheny. Um, I love John Schofield that I've actually, you know, become kind of friends with him over the last few years, hung out with him a few times. Uh, he's been a big mentor without knowing it, you know, I mean, That's uh, nice. I, you know, we hang out once in a while, but I'm, I'm such a fan. I just feel like I'm going to germ him. You know what that means? To yeah, you. yeah, yeah. I do. Reggie taught me. Yeah, I'm a stalker pretty much yeah. at this point, you know, so. Uh, That's all right. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there germing your stuff, so it's a, you get a pass. <laughs> I know. It's, it's like at this point, I think I'm more into just working on my own stuff, you know. Dude. I mean, I, I, mean it, I don't know. I can't really. And I work with one of the best singers and guitar players on the planet, you know. In Trey, know, yeah. People, people don't know Trey that much yet, but I mean, he's a major cat. And so um, just to work with him is, uh, has been a, an amazing experience. And, you know, it's funny. I think sometimes when I, when I say that, people look at me like, you know, but, but, but he is a major, major cat, man. I'll tell you, just prepare yourself. <laughs> well, I would imagine because both of you are so like um, proficient and skilled at what you do, you probably grow a lot musically from pushing each other like that no oh heck yeah man. You know, yeah uh, i got him and i play enough guitar to know that he is a badass man oh yeah he's he's a serious dude i mean there's no i mean look you don't have to listen to you know the whole album to, yeah, you know you yeah. listen to a track and you're like whoa what is this guy yeah. is on it man yeah, yeah but he's a very cool. humble guy he's very uh you know very self-facing um but i i'm you know i'm he's going to do some serious damage. He already is, but I mean, he's, he's going to be a major, major cat. So that's awesome. Uh, so I, I, ever since I've, we started working together, I, I put him in the same boat as Merle and Dolly and people like that. You know, I, I've worked with a lot of talented people and I would put him in that boat with those people, you know? And I bet he's looking at you cause you're his mentor, not just now his, his musical partner. So he's probably looking at you like he's probably going home and shitting himself. Like in the beginning, like this guy that was like, give me a call. I'm, I'm well, actually, pl no, I'm serious. No, yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. He grew up listening to me. I'm sure, you know, blue highway and, yeah. and, um, and so, yeah, so we, so we, we enjoy each other. Man. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy working with him. He's like my favorite singer and my favorite guitar player, you know, and I assume I'm his favorite Dobro player, but, uh, we, we, it's a great relationship. Yeah. Great. Really cool. Yeah. 
Hey, tell me your top three, just knee jerk reaction. And just for not for right now, top three desert Island discs. Oh God, that's way too hard, man. I know you're, you're going to put uh, Mike Aldridge in there. I'm sure. Right. Yeah. I'd have to put that first album in right. there. Dobro. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a Tony Rice had this band called the bluegrass album band. And uh, the volume three is the first one that Jerry Douglas played on. And uh, that's just an amazing record, man. It's amazing. And I really like, I mean, there's, uh, there's somebody to choose from. Um, I, can, I do, can I get four? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Pat Metheny did a record called Still Life Talking. Probably came out in the early 80s. Um, it's got a lot of Brazilian kind of stuff on there. It's got Last Train from Home, which is a pretty big, pretty big song. Um, that's a record that I probably listen to forever. And then uh, I love a lot of John Schofield albums, but Uber Jam is pretty damn cool. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if you've listened to that, but I, 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 ha I have because I had uh, Avi Bortnick on. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. 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 yeah I yeah. got friends who used to play with him in the Bay Area. Yeah. Uber Jam, yeah, he's a good, he's a nice guy. All righty. Uh, when you become excellent, especially at the level you're at, you know, there's generally a sacrifice to pay. I was curious what sacrifices you've paid to become successful. You know, it's funny. When I was a kid, I thought I was really into Tony Rice and Tony was living in the Bay Area around the time that I started playing. And he was playing with David Grisman, like we mentioned earlier. And when I started playing in bands, I had friends who kind of knew Tony or, you know, friends of friends. And they would say that he was really down on financially, you know, just barely getting by and living in Oakland, I think, at that time. And I remember just, that made a big impression on me and not a good one, you know, not, yeah. not as Tony, but as far as the biz. And I oh, thought this sure. guy's the greatest ever. How is he, if he's not making money, how the hell am I going to make mm, money? Yeah. The Dobro, you know? And, um, and so uh, what was your question again? Just, uh, sacrifices. You've, oh you've, yeah. Sacrifices. Yeah. yeah. So I kind of assumed that if I played music, I would have to make a lot of sacrifices, meaning, you know, no family, no financial security, and uh, travel. Eating dog food and stuff like dog that. Dog food. Yeah. And I remember I did a session early on. I was down in LA and I worked with this guy and we went to his apartment after, and man, it was, ugh, it was rough. And he was a professional, you know? Oh, so and that popped up in your head again. It did, man. And my grandma always said she, she, you know, she, she, she was all about music and loved it that we all played, you know, when we were kids. But she did not want me to be a musician. She literally told me, I think when I decided I was moving to Nashville, she said, Robbie, I'm just afraid you're going to end up homeless, you know. And so it was a, it was a lot of those. Like I, I mentioned that earlier, people, yeah. when you make a decision like that, you get good and bad. And some people are afraid for you or afraid for themselves or whatever, you know. And uh, so I had both. Um, and so I assumed I was going to have to make all these sacrifices. And man, somehow I've been super lucky. And, uh, you know, the band I was with, with Blue Highway, uh, you know, it was one of the top bands in Bluegrass. Yeah. And um, fortunately, I mean, our schedule was mainly weekends, you know. And wow. um, I was home during the week. Not all the time. Sometimes we'd have a 10-day run or a two-week run. But really, those were rare. And we played a lot in this part of the world. So I spent most of my time driving and I'm the only one that lived in Nashville. So I would shoot out on Thursday night and we play Friday, Saturday or Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I'd be home Sunday night or Monday night and be home for a few days and then repeat, you know, yeah. and of course more in the summer than the winter. But, um, but it allowed me, I even asked my daughter, you know, she's 20 now, but a couple of years ago, I asked her, I said, you feel like I've been here for you or I've been gone? She said, no, I feel like you've been here, you know, so. It's a great feeling. Yes, it is. Yeah. And so I think I had kind of assumed the worst when I was younger. And, uh, and I think it just goes to show, and I'll tell you, a big influence was uh, my wife has five older brothers and they're just, she comes from a great family. And they, you know, th three or four of them are artists. One's a biologist. 
and they were all really good at what they did, but they had these great families and that made an impression on me, you know, and I was like, well, maybe you can do both. Okay. <laughs> Before that, I thought if you got really good at something, it was a train, your life had to be a train wreck, you know, and it's funny in your brain, I think you, you, you will become what you think you'll become, you know, and, which is a um, blessing and a curse. Yeah. Yeah. So I was lucky to have those kinds of influences. And also when I started playing on sessions, I worked with musicians who were, I don't know, you want to call it more professional or whatever, but you know, they had great families and stuff too. It was, and they, and they were financially great. successful, really successful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so it opened my eyes and it's like, well, it doesn't have to be, uh, financially horrible, you know, and I've also, I've been smart with my money, you know, whatever yeah. I make, whatever I made, I've, I've been smart with it, you know, Good for so you. I'm not running around with my head cut off just yet because of this <laughs> Corona, yeah, stuff, yeah. you know, right. um, but, uh, but anyway, so you, you have some control over that stuff. And, um, and I, and that's one thing that I tell younger musicians, you know, it's tough, but you, you know, a lot of times I work with guys out on the road and they would just, just throw their lives away on the road every weekend. Oh, drinking, getting high, whatever, man. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and I could have done that too. And, and maybe I did a little of that, but, um, but I, you know, I didn't do that. And, yeah. And so, and that's one thing I learned as I got older is that a lot of these cats, that's why my family maybe was my, my, extended family was fearful for me because other people had tried and not succeeded or ruined their lives um, and blamed it on music. Oh, well, especially in, in you're coming out of the Bay Area, I mean, which was notorious for drugs in general back then. Yeah. You know, so I, as a parent and you're a parent, you could see like, holy crap, I could see why these guys were worried. Yes. But I think the important thing is there that the the players blamed music. Oh, it had nothing to do. Yeah, right. Okay. You know what I'm saying? When it's no, like, yeah. you, know, you know, I mean, yeah, it's tough, but you 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 made some decisions there too. Yeah, you your know? guitar yeah. isn't isn't forcing you to in to do that line of coke. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so um so anyway, so you know, you got some say in the matter. And um I I just been very lucky too, you know, and but, yeah. but I, mean, I made good decisions and, um, you know, but I had good influences and mentors, you know, and I just, again, I think I learned by imitation musically, but also with my life, you know, I yeah. was with these people who were kicking butt and, and having fun and, uh, and had their lives together, not just their music. And maybe I gravitated towards those people, you know. I don't know. But, uh, but anyway. Um, well, the other so thing is I, you were so focused on being, doing your job really, really well. Yes. Like that had to be almost an all consuming focus at a, a good chunk of time in those oh, early yeah, years. Still is, yeah. Still is. And I guess I just say, I, I honestly, I feel like I, I mean, I haven't had to make that many sacrifices. Good for you. That's great. Yeah, it's bizarre. And I count my blessings. Hey, every yeah, man. Just be happy about that. Yeah, man. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, Rob. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, nothing. Happiest moment or time in your life. <laughs> I, you know that. Uh, so, so Merle Haggard, you know, my biggest musical hero. So I got the call to play on. He came to town and did a bluegrass album. And, uh, and so it was produced by Ronnie Reno, who was in his band for many years. And so Ryan, I knew Ronnie, I'd worked with him and he called and left a message. He said, Hey, we're doing a record with Merle, bluegrass record. Merle wants to do a bluegrass record. Uh, here's the dates, you know, May so-and-so let me know if you can do it. Talk soon. And, uh, so I call him back. And I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> tell me a little more here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is he going to be there? Because sometimes you play on a record and, you know, they, they overdub their vocal later. You know, somebody like that is so huge. I didn't know. I saw, so that's the first thing I said. Is he going to be there? He said, yeah, he's going to be there. I said, and this is like, real, for real, This is, he's going to be there. And they said, yeah, man, he's, he's really excited. He's been wanting to do a bluegrass album for a while. And he feels like this is the right time. And uh, I said, I will be there. And um, so... 
I still remember, you know, we all got there early. You know, I said, session guys, get there early. So we probably all got there even earlier than normal. It was a great oh, band. Yeah. Great musicians. I knew everybody, you know. And, Who's, um, who play, any, any other guitar players on there? Um, Carl Jackson, I mentioned. Carl him. again. Yeah, okay. Yeah, great harmony singer, great songwriter, great banjo player. So he played guitar. Aubrey Haney, one of my dearest friends, uh, one of the main fiddle players in town. Mandolin plays everything, you know, but fiddle and mandolin are his main instruments. Charlie Cushman, amazing banjo and guitar player. Um, ben Isaacs from the Isaacs, a really famous gospel group, was playing bass. Um, and so, so Merle got there kind of late and uh, just sat down. Oh, here's one I wrote on the bus on the way out here. Just blew us away with this gospel <laughs> song called Pray. And, uh, and so, and started doing some others. So we kind of got our instruments and just sat around him and just sort of ran some of these songs. And we were at Ricky Skaggs' studio. And then they said, okay, let's do it, you know? So we all went into our isolation booths and we did one track of the first song and Merle stopped, oh, Marty Stewart was on it too. He played okay. it. And him and Merle are really tight. So, uh, so Merle called Marty over to his booth and they talked in there. I didn't hear what they were saying, but they were talking. And then they came out and they said, let's go back out there in a circle. And uh, I went, okay, cool. So they set up chairs, they put one microphone in the middle of the circle. And we did the whole record like that in two days. Wow. And no overdubs or anything. And um, as we went on, they slowly added microphones. First, they gave Mer. First, it was like the first song is just literally one mic, man. No, you can't mix it or anything. It's just how it happened is how it happened. And then they gave Merle a vocal mic. And then by the end of the first day, we probably all had microphones, but we never had really had headphones or anything. And we was like a jam session, you know. That is really cool. It was amazing. And so. So we'd play a song and then Merle would talk about the strangers or, you know, Roy Nichols or Reggie Young or Bonnie Owens, whatever. And I'm just freaking out because this is all, you're my <laughs> heroes, man. This is like Superman <laughs> talking about the Justice, Justice League, you know. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm a freaking expert on Merle, man. I, I know everything he's ever cut. And, uh, and the second day we were, I, just listen to this song on the way into the studio and he said well let's do this one uh, uh i wonder where i'll find you at tonight and i just heard it man on the cd when i was pulling into the studio that morning and so he starts kind of running it and on the chorus it goes to a four minor and he played a six minor and i was like oh man am i gonna tell merle haggard that he's playing the wrong chord on his song <laughs> like i can't do that and he kept doing it, and I said, ah, shit, I'm just going to tell him you that. I said, Merle, and I'm pretty sure on that chorus it goes to a four minor and not a six minor. So he said, okay, and he sang, and he played a four minor, but he sang a six minor, and so it didn't sound right. Right. He said, he said, Rob, you play the hell out of that dobro, but you're fucking wrong on that chord. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> And so I just cried. We all just started cracking up. And I said, okay, it's all good, man. And, That's funny, uh, man. And so we cut the song. And, uh, and it sounds great with the six biter. But uh, I, I give you credit for having the, that was a ballsy thing to do. And I don't mean in a bad way, but like I give you credit for that, man. Yeah, it's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, it was funny, man. I felt really, I actually felt really comfortable. I feel like I'd known him my whole life, you know. That's great. And, so that was one of the best two days of my life. And then like the net, like a day or two later, his manager calls me and says uh, that Merle wants you to come out to California and record with him at his house, at his home studio. And I, and I was so excited because that was just the ultimate compliment, you know, and I think he really liked what I was playing and he liked that I was from California. Um, yeah. Lot okay. of, you know, when you play bluegrass and country, you know, you got to be from the Southeast, you know? <laughs> right. Right. And, uh, and yet, I think he heard something in my plan, you know, that, that he knew I'd studied his music, I'm sure, you know, and even he told me, he said, you, you, you remind me of Roy Nichols. And that was a huge compliment. Man, that is pretty huge. And uh, so when he told, so when his manager called me and said, well, here's the dates, you know, we're going to fly you out there to Reading, you know, and I, you know, I knew I'd been close to his house and I had a lot of friends up in Reading in the middle of nowhere up in Northern California where Merle lived. 
So after I got off that phone, I literally just jumped around the house. You know, my daughter was probably seven or something at the time. And uh, wow. she talks about that. So that was probably my happiest day musically, you know. That's awesome. That's, that's, that's very cool, man. <laughs> you have any hobbies outside of music? Rob? Not much. I mean, I like to get outside. And when I was a kid, we did a lot of camping and outdoor stuff. And I mentioned my grandparents' campground on the Eel yeah. River. Um, and we pretty much lived outside, you know, she took care of a bunch of kids and she called it Kid Hill and she had like six or seven bunks up there under the redwoods and it was so mild there in the summer. It never rained. Very rarely did it rain. So we slept outside every night oh, that's and, nice. uh, got up and we'd do some work around the campground in the morning and then swim all day. And, um, so anyway, I love being outside and it's, that's, that's a sacrifice, I guess, in this business. You just got to travel so much, you know. Yeah. I'm totally sick of airplanes and cars and vans and buses. Um, but uh, so I do like to, you know, I try to run a few days a week or walk. I like hiking. Um, I mean, I like backpacking, but it's so tornadic out here in Tennessee. Like in California, you can go hiking anytime you want. You're probably not going to get rained on. And my wife and I, you know, we've had tents and the pop-up trailer and different things with the kids. And it's just like every time we go, we get destroyed by a tornadic storm or, you know, just a severe thunderstorm. You had something yesterday, didn't you? Oh, man. I was, I was, on, the, I was on the phone with a buddy of mine and, and he's like, holy <laughs> shit, I got to go. I'm like, what's the matter? He goes, hold on a minute. And then he just, I, I heard the phone like muffler and he goes, there's a tornado here. It just came out of nowhere. I'm like, what? It got black, man. Yeah, it's the same thing at our house. And we went for a walk this morning, and there's a big tree down in front of our neighbor's house. Just, same thing with this guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so to, that kind of takes the fun out of being outside when you're uh, like, you know, yeah. it kind of looks like a tornado, tornadic storm coming our way. And it happens, you know, they won't necessarily breed a tornado, but you get a, you get a pretty heavy thunderstorm a lot from April through august you know yeah so it's hard to take your kids i'm just gonna be a wimp and say it. it's just hard to take your hard to do stuff outdoors you know plus it's so wet and humid and it's now hot. it's and gross it's, so so I've, I've tried to sort of recreate my childhood with my kids and take them out camping and stuff but i just i ain't got the <laughs> it's hot it's gross man and, the, it's hot. and then it's, they're the same way i think i've ruined them on the outdoors because every time we go it's just muggy and hot and sweaty so anyway but i do like that and i've got uh, some friends who do a lot of outdoor stuff so i'll tag along with them sometimes um cool i try to read a lot um which is nice on airplanes and when you're traveling um and i've been cooking more and i think i think that's kind of more my groove because that's the other thing with trying to get outside and do something i travel so much i'm not going to come home from a 10-day trip and then go fly. on a hike <laughs> <laughs> you know, drive six hours and go camping you know yeah so anyway uh I, I yeah maybe when i retire i'll do more of that stuff but uh i think cooking is going to be easier <laughs> it's the number one hobby for musicians cooking is it really yeah, okay. absolutely. It makes sense man makes sense. absolutely yeah, pinch of this pinch it. of that it's like making a song man. uh two yeah, more questions exactly. Rob. what's that improvising yeah totally <laughs> Uh, two questions. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that change has been intentional and how much is a part of aging? Uh, good, good question. You know, I mean, I think I've just, I don't know, I was the youngest and I was, you know, I kind of felt like my parents were great, you know, but they really spoiled us. I mean, they did everything for us. We very, had very few chores or anything. And so I feel like I've, I'm still trying to kind of become an adult, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I think I, I keep pushing myself into more responsibilities, you know. Um, and so, you know, like you mentioned Rezo Summit, it's a Dobro teaching weekend that I put on with my business partner. Um, and, uh, and so just putting myself out there, I don't know, I think I, I think I'm kind of a scaredy cat in some ways. Um, so I just keep pushing myself. <laughs> There's great. part of me that's just content to answer the phone or whatever, but I notice as I get older, I kind of make these situations that push me. Again, working with Trey is a perfect example, you know, 
I mean, it really was a big decision to leave Blue Highway. That was like, because I just, everything had just kind of come at me and I'd just been able to just say, yeah, okay, cool, I'll do that one. And that was the, one of the first times where I'd really just said, I made the decision, you know what I mean? And so that As was- As opposed to this and this happened and it was right at the time. Exactly, yeah, exactly. I understand that. Um, yeah, well. yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. 100%, so, yeah. So for most of my life, it just been kind of like things, doors had opened and pulled me in, you know? Yeah. So this time I was opening a door and yeah. pulling myself in, you know? Totally different so that, feeling. It, 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 totally, is, yeah. it feels much better, actually. Yeah, yeah. Look, maybe a little scarier, but it's like, it's not really scary because you're doing it like something's like, like you said, you just had this gut intuition. And yeah, and I think that that's, I think trying to live more intuitively or by your gut, you know, and having that guide your decisions more, you know, it's just tough to know what's the right is. Basically, we're self-employed people, you know. You are entrepreneurs, small business owners, 100%. percent all man. magic out of it here with that term, but it's real, you know. It's and, true. And what I mean by that is, uh, hell, we don't know what's happening. You know, it takes a lot of faith, you know, and that, that people are going to call. Uh, this thing's going to go through. You're going to, you know, people are going to dig it. It's, it's a lot of conjecture, you know. You have to have a lot of faith. And yes. so so um yeah so that's it that's so trying to so going by more your instinct like this feels good working with this person i trust this person uh i'm getting a good feeling about this this let's do it uh trying to trying to be more aware of those int intuitions and following them yeah right on man so that's, that's awesome. probably yeah that's probably something i do different now than i did before and last question, most important lesson life has taught you? Oh, God. That's tough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're talking about... You just cut the interview off, like, right there. <laughs> oh, God, that's it. And then people are like, what? The <laughs> yeah, we were talking about sacrifices before. I remember my wife, before we were married, you know, I remember telling her, I said, I don't know if you want to be with me because it's going to get rough, you know. I, yeah. Again, I kind of assumed that I was going to be poor and I was going to be on the road all the time, you know? Mm. And, um, and so my, I didn't scare her off. You know, my wife just, uh, she's always been there for me and been very supportive. So uh, that was probably the being with her, you know, was probably the best decision. I ever awesome. Made, you know? so, and how long y'all been together? Uh, we met in 87 and we got married in 94. So, wow. So that's 34 years, 30, wow, that's, 87 that's to yeah. 2000, 13 and, and 20, yeah. 33 years. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations. That is awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you. That's yeah. She's really amazing. cool. And, yeah. So I never, it's good to have that. We're on the same team. <laughs> yeah that's so know, you know people, so critical so f it makes the yeah. all the difference in the world in your life yeah, yeah and your yeah. happiness so factor me, man. You know, yeah yeah and uh you know we were pretty young when we met and uh so who you know like i said just to just follow your intuition you know but i definitely made the right decision <laughs> right on said. man absolutely that's great congratulations man i'm happy thank for you, you. Thank you. uh I want to talk about a couple of things uh, that you have. <laughs> Sorry, I, love, I love the car <laughs> underneath that. Uh, no, it's no big deal. Uh, talk I love it because it comes on my computer and my phone. and everything. Oh, No worries, man. Uh, talk about, you, you have this thing you just mentioned, bigmusictent.com. You recently launched it. Talk about that. What's involved in it? How do people get it? And who are the people that would most benefit from checking it out? Yeah. Um, so in October, we launched uh, bigmusictent.com and it's a, a teaching website and it's a subscription based service. And so basically the last year or two, we've been making videos, um, instructional videos, and I'm, I'm the first uh, faculty member um, on the site, but we're going to spread it to other instruments. Um, and um, uh, I have done, you know, instructional DVDs in the past. I put on Rezo Summit, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, you know, Dobro camp, basically four days every November in Nashville. And we have people come from all over the world. Um, so, you know, I think I've got a good reputation for teaching. 
Um, I don't do a lot of it, um, but I do enjoy what I do get to do. And I tell you what I like is just trying to get, the dobro is a very mysterious instrument. Yeah. It is, man. I mean, you play, you know, you play with a metal bar in your left hand, you have finger picks on your right hand. It's just weird. <laughs> Especially it it is mysterious. The left hand is so such a different technique. Of course, it comes from Hawaiian guitar. You know? Slack key guitar, yeah. Yeah, and um, so I enjoy trying to help people figure it out and take away some of the mystery. And I tell you, Dude, that should be your one of your classes, taking the mystery out of the dobro. That's that's it. That's your next class, man. Yeah, I like it. I like yeah, it. taking uh, the mystery out of the dobro. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of well, because it's the technique is weird. It's different. Definitely nobody plays it you know not many people play it and even fewer teach it you know and it sounds and really cool it's the coolest man of course i'm gonna say that but i mean it's like an electric guitar without needing an amp you know what i mean you can slide <laughs> and get all this sustain yeah and um and so you know i i i'm a and I'm, I'm an evangelist for the instrument, you know? And so I want more people to play the dobro, you know? And it's a great, you know, a lot of people pick it up as a second instrument, you know? Sure. People pick it up and play a little bit on sessions or jams or whatever, but it's such a great instrument. And I just read this great book called Kika Kila, K-I-K-A-K-I-L-A. And it's about the history of the Hawaiian guitar. It just came out a couple of years ago. And yeah, I had no idea. I mean, Hawaiian guitar, Hawaiian music just took over the whole world, man. Like in the late 1800s up to about World War II, it's just like people could not get enough of it, you know. And it influenced the blues that, you know, that in this book, he makes the argument that, you know, slide players, that came from Hawaiian music, you know. That's right, it did. But these Hawaiian musicians were touring all over the Southeast and all over the world. And they were doing these vaudeville shows. Interesting. And, and it just sort of like, people just it just blew people's minds you know so um so it's great for me to to hear about that and learn a little more about the instrument that i play you know um but anyway um so bigmusictent.com is just a way to uh that people can learn how to play and learn how to become a better musician and like you get like i said i'm the first uh you know instructor but we're gonna have others as time moves on and, um, and yeah, it just kind of fits in with one of my goals, I guess. It's just getting people to know more about the instrument and get into the instrument. Cause it is such a, again, it's like having an electric guitar without an amp, without having to carry an amp. Right on. And that's, so if, if you want to check that out, uh, check out bigmusictent.com. Also, uh, Rob Ikes and Trey Hensley, who Rob talked about. These guys rock, man. They're a great duo. Their last three records are out before the sun goes down, the country blues, and last year's world full of blues. And he, uh, Rob mentioned in there that it goes beyond bluegrass, and it definitely does. It's really good music on there. Man. I mean, these guys are just phenomenal. I mean, ridiculously phenomenal <laughs> players, man. So um, there's a lot of stuff happening on those records. Um, a lot of really nice stuff happening on those records. Um, Three Bells, another record that you ought to check out from Rob. It's with, he played with Mike Aldridge and Jerry Douglas. And you guys are Grammy nominated on that? Yeah, yeah. That was um, a neat project that Jerry Douglas kind of spearheaded and called Mike and myself. Um, Mike had had cancer for several years, but he was still in pretty good shape. But I think we all knew, you know, he yeah. wasn't going to be around forever. And he was a mentor to both Jerry and I, you know, and a friend. So I think Jerry just wanted to get in and document the three of us playing together. Again, just because he loves the Dobro too. Yeah. Let's just kind of celebrate this instrument and, and what happens on it, you know. And so and Jerry said, let's do it just the three of us, no band, you know, no guitar, no bass. I was like, wow, are you sure you want to do that, you know? And he said, yeah, it'll be great. And, uh, you know, it turns out it was great. I was a little concerned because, again, the dobro is fretless. So you're playing with a slide, and I'm just thinking, man, three dobros, that could, there's a lot of room for out of tune stuff, you know? And we got down there the first day and started playing, and it was just perfect, man. It was just great. And so it was an amazing, we all just had an amazing experience and, uh, and it was a thrill, you know, those, those guys are my two main influences on the instrument. Right. So I was, I was in heaven. Again, you talk about your best day or best experience. Happiest yeah. day. I was, that was one of them too, man. I was there with that along with the Merle Haggard record. I definitely have to say that three bells record experience. 
That's awesome. Uh, anything else? Do you want? Do you want anybody to follow you on social media or anything like that? Yeah, I do Instagram and Facebook, and uh, yeah, you know, robintray.com is our website. Yeah, and again, that's kind of my main road thing at this point. So if people want to see us live, that's the best way to find out. You know where we'll be. Right on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you have Facebook links on there, I think, if I remember correctly, or taking you to the Facebook page, for Rob and Trey. And hopefully we'll see you guys out and hopefully I'll see you guys down in Tampa. That'd be great. That sounds great. Yeah, we were supposed to be there in April. So. <laughs> oh, my God. And you know what, man? I got to tell you this. I'm sure people have told you this before. You look like a young Hugh Hefner. No, people have told you that oh, before, right? Wow. <laughs> you do. Come, that one. Are you I'll serious? Never You've that. never no. heard that one? Uh-uh. Oh, my God. All you need is like an ascot and a pipe. And I'm like, you know, I'll be asking you <laughs> totally different stories here, man. Oh, that's now, great. Uh, the whole time I'm saying, man, this guy looks just like Hugh Hefner, like a young Hugh Hefner. That's so I'm funny. It on my website for sure. There, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, uh, listen, uh, I'm going to wrap this up, but thank you very much for everything. Anything I missed that you want to talk about or, or make people aware of? I think we're good, man. Awesome. Good luck with Big Music 10, and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Rob Ikes. Please, again, check Rob out, Rob Ikes and Trey Hensley. Rob and Trey is the website? Robintrey.com robintrey.com uh three bells and their last three records are great before the sun goes down the country blues and last year's world full of blues and i'm pretty sure they're gonna have something else coming out in the next six to eight months or so if i had to bet money which i'm not a bet man <laughs> uh thank you again man i appreciate it uh thank everybody thank you for listening and most important especially nowadays don't forget that happiness is a choice so choose wisely be nice go play your guitar and have fun Till next time, or your dobro. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Rob, thanks for everything, brother. Thanks, man.